recording. And since we're recording, I'm going to introduce you. So ladies and gentlemen who are listening later, this is Stephen Lim, and uh, I will let him take it from here. Uh, thank you so much, Anne. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to talk about composition communication, introducing students to essay writing. Uh, so this event is titled The Challenge of Change, and uh, I feel that's very appropriate. Uh, we've all faced significant changes and significant challenges since the onset of the pandemic uh, in 2020. And uh, for me, I teach in a public junior high school, and uh, we, we never went to online teaching, so that presented its own unique challenges. And when we came back for the new academic year in April 2020, there were a lot of new rules that were implemented. Uh, for example, classes were divided into four. So the boys and the girls were separated, and then amongst the boys and the girls, they were separated into two as well. So I teach classes of 36 to 40 students, uh, and about 10 would come in at a time. So uh, quite a significant change, just to keep that two meter uh, distance. We were also told that we shouldn't do pair work or group work, uh, which, as you can imagine, makes uh, teaching oral communication incredibly challenging. Uh, and we were recommended that students to stick to private speech only. So either non-verbalizing or whispering very quietly. In fact, we were told that if we wanted to assess students' audible output, they should speak out the window, which I found utterly charming and a unique uh, solution to this problem. And as I mentioned, the, the main challenge here for me was I'm a teacher who focuses on oral communication. How do you teach oral communication when your students are not supposed to communicate? So uh, I decided to change my focus from oral communication to written communication. I felt that it was important to develop students' uh, communicative abilities in a different context and allow them to express themselves uh, in a different format. So why did I choose uh, essay compositions? Well, there are quite a few benefits for teachers. First, essay writing uh, needs explicit instruction. Students can't be expected to produce their own paragraphs if they haven't been taught explicitly how to do it. It's quite complicated. They need specific structure. They need exp uh, certain expressions as well. It's also a communicative activity. Um, it gives them the chance to express their own opinions, which is very important. You need junior high school students to be able to come up with their own thoughts and express them in English. Uh, next, it's a logical culmination to a four skills lesson. So if you're, well, initially I couldn't do any speaking with them, but if you're doing a speaking, a listening and a reading, by practicing those three things, it's providing them with a platform from which to make their own essay compositions, because writing is probably the most difficult of the four skills. And next, it also provides evidence of learning. Now, from 2020, the Japanese curriculum changed significantly. And one of the side effects of that was that teachers need significantly more proof of learning. Uh, they need evidence to show that the student has produced learning. And obviously, with oral communication, that's actually much more difficult. Uh, with written communication, you have a lot more things to prove that your students have been studying. Uh, and it also promotes critical thinking. Now, obviously, critical thinking has been a buzzword for the last two decades. Um, it's important, as I mentioned before, for students to come up with their own opinions and come up with logical reasons behind those opinions, and also to take uh, opinions of other people's and incorporate it into their own. So for the students, the kind of benefits they see is that learners want feedback. And when you're doing oral communication, it's actually very difficult to give learners feedback especially when you're dealing with classes like mine, which are 36 to 40 students. How can you possibly listen to them all and give them that feedback? Writing, on the other hand, you have time to look at each learner's individual output and then give them individualized feedback, which they wouldn't be able to have through uh, oral learning. Then the Juku issue, which if any of you work in junior high school or high school, you've definitely encountered. Uh, my students in the third grade of junior high school, especially, go to Juku two or three times a week. And guess what? Those teachers teach exactly the same textbooks that I teach. So many of the students have already learned what we're trying to teach them. By teaching them composition writing, you're giving them something that they don't necessarily have access to at Juku, or at least they don't have as much as they could do. Uh, okay, um, there we go. 
<laughs> so another important thing is that it's a community of output outlet for less verbal learners. Uh, this is something that you probably notice in Japan that some of the students who are actually very good at English are not very good at speaking English. Now, whether that's confidence issues or they haven't had enough pronunciation practice, or maybe that's just not the way they like to communicate. This gives teachers an opportunity to see their communicative ability, which doesn't rely on oral output, which obviously if you're dealing with many different kinds of learners, you need many different kinds of opportunities for them to show their abilities. And then also it's very relevant to their immediate needs. Um, high school entrance exams, do contain one question, which is a composition question, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So you're giving them something they can actually use in the near future. So as I mentioned, uh, this is used uh, in the exams, this composition question, and it's a good introduction to metacognitive writing strategies, which probably they would not otherwise encounter in junior high school. You're showing them the value of practice, how repeating the same task leads to better results. You're showing that they need to plan answers to writing uh, essays. You can't just start writing what, what comes to mind. You have to have some structure in mind before you commit to it. And it is providing them with basic structures so that they can use these abstract structures in response to different kinds of essay questions. So they always have something to rely on uh, in a pinch. And you're teaching them to manage time. Uh, it's estimated that in exam situations, they only have seven to 10 minutes to answer this composition question. You're teaching them what seven minutes feels like, and that's very important when you're taking an exam. And finally, something that I struggle with myself, once you've written something, you really need to check it. And a lot of students will just finish an essay, put it down on the table, and thank God I have finished that. You're teaching them to go through it one more time, to look for the errors, to look for the punctuation mistakes, the spelling mistakes. It's very important to teach them these metacognitive writing strategies. Okay, so what is the composition question? I mentioned that it's in the high school entrance exam. So it's worth 10 points. And uh, the kind of composition question I actually talk about is for advanced high schools. Now in my school, uh, roughly 30 to 40 percent of the students apply for these advanced high schools. So for the students who are not applying for advanced high schools, you need to tell them that it's going to benefit them as well. You need them to understand that by practicing these writing questions, it's also going to improve their overall writing ability and subsequently their vocabulary, their grammar, all these things that get developed through writing skills. So even though you might think it's overkill, it's really not. And especially if you gradually build up to it, it's useful to all students. The instructions they face in the exam is this, write 40 to 50 words. It's there's slightly more than that, but honestly not much more. Um, and they're given a short reading passage. So why don't we have a look at uh, an example question from uh, an exam book you can buy. I'm not gonna ask you to read all of this, um, but I want you to look at the last sentence. Some people say that elementary school children should spend more time in nature. What do you think about this? So if you look at this, you'll notice a lot of asterisks, asterisks which are um, words that they don't necessarily expect the students to know. There's a translation just below. Uh, but you're asking students to give an answer to a question they probably never considered before. And this writing, uh, sorry, this reading material they're provided with, it's not someone's opinion they can model their own opinion off. It's literally just setting up the scenario. So, I mean, honestly, this is a challenging situation for perhaps native speaker children of the same level to come up with an answer to this question in just seven minutes. It really highlights you need to prepare students for this question. And there's also a very specific format to how they're supposed to answer this. Uh, it's one word for one line and punctuation isn't on its own separate line. So again, you need to prepare your students, otherwise they're gonna go into exams sight unseen and have to suddenly learn all these rules. So how do you establish a writing module in a junior high school? Well, some of the key points are you need to explain the purpose, not just to the other teachers, but directly to the students. You need to know or rather you need to tell them why you're doing this because you need them to buy into the idea. It is hard work, it is challenging, and the students need to understand how it will benefit them. And they're so obsessed with high school entrance exams by the third grade. If you tell them it's on the exam, they will buy into it pretty much anyway. Uh, the important thing is to start simple. So you really need questions 
that are not challenging at all, at least in terms of the topic. And then from there, you need to build up gradually. As I mentioned before, only 30 to 40% of my students will take the more advanced high school questions. So you need to give something that all the students can respond to, and you need to provide appropriate scaffolding for them. So your students need to have assistance. And as I mentioned, in my school, there's a vast difference of abilities within a single class. So you need to give a lot of support, but you need to tell the students it's up to them how much they use. If they're weaker, if they lack confidence, absolutely use every single uh, bit of scaffolding that I provide you with. If you're a high level student, if you need to challenge yourself, you should try and use less and less of it. And uh, also you need to make students aware of their progress um, because they will improve significantly over the course of a year in their writing ability. Get them to keep all of these examples of questions they've answered in a file and get them to look back and notice how their writing has developed and that will really give them a sense of self-efficacy. So let me describe to you or rather show you uh, what I mean by gradual building up. This is an example of a first question that I would ask them. What did you do last weekend? The important things about this is it's factual. It's not asking for an opinion and it's just using the past simple. Okay, so it's one tense they have to deal with essentially. And it's factual, so they just have to recall what they did. The, sub, the, uh, the next question that I would ask is, which do you like better, summer or winter? So you're giving them a choice, but only two things to choose from. And also the vocabulary associated with both the seasons is actually quite simple and something they'd be rather familiar with. Uh, it's also probably something they already have an opinion on. Oh, okay, next uh, I'd ask them, is it important to study English? So uh, you're getting to more abstract notions here, but the important thing is, again, it's a yes, no answer. And it's something they definitely have an opinion on and probably quite a strong opinion on. Uh, and they are also familiar with a lot of vocabulary that they could use like reading, writing and exams, making friends, that kind of thing. Once you get to question four, you're starting to get to those more challenging notions. What can we do to save the earth? Now, this is a, not a yes, no uh, question, and it's a rather challenging idea as well. However, the good thing is that all junior high school textbooks contain at least one program that is to do with environmental issues. So they'll have a reference point and they'll understand a lot of vocabulary to do with answering this question. And then once you get to the very final question, uh, today, AI is used in computers and robots. Some people say AI should be used more. What do you think about this idea? This is a real high school question, uh, entrance exam question, and it is that challenging. So this is why you need to build students up to this kind of question. Uh, I just like to clarify, this is not a five week program. You should not be going one, two, three, four, five. This is just an example of how you would gradually increase the difficulty. So a uh, part of this is this very simple score system. I actually grade uh, papers based only on the word count. So if they write less than 10 words, they get a D. 10 to 19, a C. 20 to 39, a B and 40 or more, an A. I know it seems ridiculous. It's so simplistic, but the important thing is you're trying to develop their fluency. Writing fluency is something they don't get a chance to develop because they're so focused on accuracy. You need to train them to start writing. Otherwise, they're going to have that fear of the blank page when they step into that examination room. You get a bit more nuance when it comes to the plus minus system. So I explained to them that whether they get a plus, a minus or neither depends on their grammar, their spelling and whether I personally find it interesting. Now, obviously, that's a very vague notion, but it's just to encourage them uh, to try and produce original answers and to vary the grammar and vocabulary they use throughout it. I also have this uh, little one in brackets, logical, which I don't explain to them because hopefully it's self-evident. However, I have had a student write his own name 50 times. And to that student, I gave an A minus. And I said to him, well done, you beat the system. You can never do that again. So. Everyone has a laugh. You have to treat this situation with humor, but you know, at the end of the day, most students don't make that kind of decision and they, they try it honestly. So 
it really hasn't caused that significant an issue, this marking system. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's part of a four skills integrated lesson, and let me show you how. First, you start with a speaking activity where you put them in pairs and um, they talk about either the same question that will appear in the writing or they talk about a very similar one. And they're going to be using, activating their existing knowledge and existing vocabulary. So it's a good chance for them to stretch themselves linguistically. Next, we move on to listening. Uh, I usually do a quick vocabulary quiz and all the words are ones that will be useful for them when they're writing their answers. And also I usually do another listening section in which other people are answering the same question. So they get a different than I, they get an idea of uh, different opinions on the matter and they can start to agree or disagree with some of those. Uh, next, if you'll bear with me. Okay, so reading, uh, I give them a couple of model examples so they can have something to base off base their answers off if they're struggling. And then writing is the synthesis of these three skills. So everything they've learned, everything they practiced over the course of the lesson can go into their composition writing answer. Let me show you an example. So this is a question I might give them. Do you want to live in a city or a village in the future? There are seven stages, a greeting, pair conversations, a pre-task, which is the listening I mentioned before, uh, models, seven minute writing, peer feedback, and then bonus time. So I think for uh, an introduction, it's very important for teachers to use their own personal stories and uh, use realia as well. So uh, as an example, I'd show them this picture and say, this is my hometown. This is where I live in England. And you can see it's very beautiful and it's very quiet and it's very boring. And there are no people there. So when I came to Tokyo, I was really, really excited. And do you know why I was so excited? Because of convenience stores. In my hometown, there are only two shops and they both close at 5 p.m. I couldn't believe that convenience stores were open 24 hours a day. So I thought that Tokyo was very exciting and very convenient. So obviously you're just introducing them to some of the language that's there and giving you an idea of your own opinion so that they can uh, start to think of theirs. Okay, then next uh, I put them in pairs and get them to talk about the topic. So a question I might give them is which do you like better, Tokyo or Saitama? I like better than because. And you tell them to think of at least two to three reasons. And I always give them two minutes preparation time first. I've found that if you don't give them that two minutes preparation time, they will struggle. But give them two minutes preparation time, a space to write, jot down their answers, a memo box, and tell them they can write in English or Japanese. And it facilitates them speaking for much longer. So then I'll get them to try and talk for two minutes together. And that two minutes preparation time really helps significantly. They produce a lot more in that situation. So I highly recommend it. Then I'll ask three to five pairs to stand up and give their performances. Uh, this is just to keep them honest and make sure they have actually been practicing this. So it keeps them on their toes. Then the pre-task, I mentioned I might do a quick vocabulary quiz first. These are eight words that I would read and get them to try and write down. So you're providing them with, with the spelling and you're also providing them with words that they might use in their own compositions. And then, as I mentioned, a listening activity. They listen to people's opinions, try to guess if they want to live in a village or a city and why. And then we move on to models. So I have an A model here and a B model. The A model is the simple one. So you can see the first sentence answers the question. I have three reasons, first, second, third, and then once more restating your answer. This is a really useful model to give to students because it just works for almost any composition question. So especially for low confidence learners, you should push this structure, at least at first. Uh, it's really helpful for them. B is a slightly looser, more challenging structure. Uh, you can see that there are a lot of connective words used here. There's a lot more adjectives um, and it's just longer. So students can look at these models. They can underline uh, grammar points that they think will be important and they can see what kind of thing they'll personally be aiming for. 
Okay, so uh, then this is what the writing paper looks like. Uh, they just get this and they get seven minutes to write. So I always give them the lowest end of the scale first. Uh, and obviously it's 10 minutes down there just to give them some time to prepare. I usually do give them another two minutes to jot down in Japanese or English their memo to prepare them for the writing. And then they get on with it. And then after the seven minutes is up, they switch with their partner. And what they have to do is they have to read each other's papers and they have to write a positive comment, not a negative one. Next, they check each other's papers. Um, and I ask them to check for whether it's omoji or komoji, komoji, so capitalization or lowercase. I check them, I ask them to check for punctuation, periods and commas, and spelling as well. So the important thing is that even high level learners forget to put periods, uh, forget to put commas, and low level learners can pick that out. So it really does help them to develop a, like, a stronger bond. And uh, you're also getting them to help each other. So if there is a struggling student who's paired with a stronger student, they can give them some ideas about how to progress from there. Uh, it's also very important whether you're a stronger learner or a weaker learner to understand that writing is not an isolated thing. It should be a collaborative effort and it really encourages them not to feel lost and alone when they're practicing writing. So that's why I always encourage peer feedback uh, sessions in these composition writings. Then I give them bonus time. So a lot of them can choose to consult their peers, consult the teachers, use material resources like dictionaries or, or textbooks uh, or worksheets that they might have. Uh, then I give them the chance to do a perfect check. So if they have incredible amounts of confidence, have nothing to add, they can bring their paper up to me and I will definitely find at least one mistake. Uh, and then afterwards I collect the papers. So the bonus time, they usually use it just to write more. Uh, it is impressive to see that they're just willing to keep going on this. So how do you do feedback and assessment? I teach like 180 third grade students. I also do this with my second grade students as well. What are you gonna do? Well, I do the underline three method, which I highly recommend when you're dealing with this many students. You don't fix every mistake. You just take a red pen and underline three errors. These errors are things like spelling, subject verb agreement, punctuation or tense. The important thing is these are things that students can self-correct and they're errors that are repeated. You just underline them, the students look at the red pen and they try and think what the mistake is and fix it. If they wanna hand it back to you, they can. The things that are more complicated, you have to reteach. So word order, articles, prepositions, collocations, it's something that you can't help but just underlining them. So they're things they can't self-correct. They require explicit instruction. If there are common errors, you need to note them and teach them at the start of the next lesson. The important thing is it's a long-term assessment. You give students the opportunity to redo these outside of class. If they give it back to you, you improve their grade. Why wouldn't you? You want to give students the opportunity to learn more. There's no point in denying them that opportunity. Uh, you tell them it's portfolio based. So they'll choose one or two of their papers done over the course of a semester, and they'll submit those as their ones to be graded. Uh, this is really to incentivize grades. Um, I always give a very small percentage of their total grade, like 5% to these written compositions, so they know there is meaning behind this. And again, it also provides more accessible proof of learning. All right, so to sum things up, the benefits they're getting, uh, it's a meaningful integration of the four skills. Fluency development, which is very difficult. Uh, those who subscribe to uh, Nations Four Strands will know that fluency is very important and honestly something that they don't often get. Um, junior high school students usually learn a grammar point, move on to the next grammar point. No attempt to develop that knowledge of the grammar point, so it's very valuable for it. Uh, it's schemata activation and development, which again is something they might not be familiar with at that age. Uh, in an introduction to metacognitive writing strategies, and it's an active form of feedback that I mentioned before. If you just give them the answer in your uh, feedback, like 60, 70% will not even notice it. They won't even think about it. So you want to give them an active form of feedback. And as I mentioned before, it does develop critical thinking, which gosh, that's a very popular term in the teaching community. Okay, the most important thing for me though, I think it develops a student sense of self-efficacy. So, you know, students at the end of term, 
the third third graders at the uh, end of the year will write letters to the teachers. And you know, before I started doing this, teachers were like, oh, you know, had fun. Thanks for learning. Terrible English. But um, the great thing is that since I started doing this, teachers have uh, teachers students have specifically written to me saying, your writing lessons helped me. Your writing lessons made me better at English. Your writing lessons helped me in the exam. And as a teacher, honestly, that is the most satisfying thing. When you actually feel as though, of course, English should be fun, but when you're helping students. And personally, for me, uh, at the start of the pandemic, again, I was a, an oral communication teacher. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had to entirely reassess my concept of what teaching English was. But from this you know, challenge came, came a huge change for me and a huge opportunity. And I think it's really developed my teaching skills to a point where I feel confident that I can help students in developing their writing abilities. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for your presentation. I told you you'd have an audience. <laughs> Thank you. The slides really didn't want to cooperate, did they? Like, <laughs> that always happens to me. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hands or put questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, Catherine, three years head start to uni entrance exam preparation. So um, I did do a study uh, for uh, junior high school teachers as to what they prioritized uh, when teaching their students. So whether they would, you know, were most concerned with, you know, developing their oral communication, high school entrance exams, like the, the class situation, the ability of the students. The craziest thing is for junior high school teachers, the number one most important thing for them was preparing students for the high school entrance exam. Not necessarily surprising, but preparing their junior high school students for the university entrance exam was also in the top five, which is frankly blows my mind. You know, it's something that they will never have to encounter. A lot of them don't really know what's on the university entrance exam. So I found it quite curious that it ranked so high. Um, yeah, it's uh, obviously the exam situation is very important. And listening to the, uh, the kids speak earlier about wanting more fun and communicative lessons, I. I felt terrible that I'm I'm going to do a presentation about teaching more writing. So uh, I understand you do need to balance the two things, but uh, you do need a very strong foundation at this early age for them to sure. finally build on it. Because I'm teaching university writing classes, and they definitely don't have many of them don't have this kind of basic foundation. So you could tell. So uh, well done. <laughs> Your students are going to be at a very uh, high advantage when they start. Studying well, a stage. few of the university teachers I've spoken to um, when they know I teach at junior high school said to me, please, please, please teach them how to use because. Tell them not to put it at the start of a sentence. And so I, <laughs> oh, how many times have I taught that? Um, it, is, it is very hard to unlearn. I don't know where they learn it from, but it's very hard to unlearn that. So I think it's a response to the why questions, right? Uh, yeah, but even in these exam, uh, even in the more open-ended questions, they'll just, they must have, you're right, they must have learned it from yeah. answering why questions and they just stick to that. So, exactly. Yeah, I see them on university entrance exam, same way, because this, because that. <laughs> lots of fragments. You have one more question in the chat and that's probably all you have time for. <laughs> oh, sure. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, <laughs> Sure, yes, uh, that's a good point. So uh, obviously you could answer it with a yes, no, but uh, when you specifically say to them, your goal is to write 40 to 50 words and you always explain the grammar point, uh, sorry, the uh, scoring system beforehand, then they're forced to produce something. Like even if it doesn't feel necessarily natural to them, they, they come up with reasons. And obviously by looking at the models and giving them a lot of, uh, a lot of examples of the kind of thing you're expecting, they do tend to understand that they need to produce uh, quite a few answers to this. Obviously with some lower level students, they might just say, yes, no, put down the paper, put down the pen. But the good thing about the scoring system is when the students hand in the paper, they know what their grade is. Like it's not as though they can be surprised by it um, because it's 
overly simplistic in a way. They're, it's it's their own responsibility, and it's very transparent as to what their grade will be. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a couple of people coming and listening. I thought it'd just be me and Catherine, so I really appreciate you coming by. Thank you so much for your presentation.